Hello, screenwriters, and welcome to Writing for Screens, the screenwriting step-by-step -step project, episode number 49. My name is Glenn Gers. I am here every Monday through Friday at 3 p.m. Pacific Standard Time, if I can be, to work on a pilot script uh, from beginning a uh, rough idea to final script so that you can look over my shoulder and get a sense of what this process is. Just my process, not the only process. Everyone has to find their own best plan and process, but I'm hoping to just take the, the voodoo out of it by uh, showing you that it's just work. It's just a, a mechanical and creative uh, task that you can take on and adjust to your own needs and goals and vision. Um, if you want to ask me anything, I am here. If you are not watching live, you are free to ask me a question via writingforscreens.com, my website. You click on the old Contact Me button and you can contact me with a question or a comment. Plus, if you don't want to do that, you can just go to the comment section below this very video and every video on the channel. If you write something there, you hit comment, you ask a question, you give me a comment. I get it directly through the internet. Amazing stuff. So I will answer it uh, as best I can there, here, however it works. There's a whole bunch of you out here. Hello, hello. Hello, 99 Precinct. Hello, Maria. Hello, Matt. Hello, Dream Phaser. You made it. <laughs> wow. Hello, Angelo. And hello, Foam Heart. Uh, a lot of regulars here and some new folks. So glad to see you all. We are here to work. So I'm going to get right to the work uh, because I had some ideas. So I want to tell you about that. Um, uh, last night, going to bed. Um, not, not I, I don't like to work at night. I got to tell you this. Um, I do not uh, work well in the evenings, um, but things come to you. This is what happens. I was thinking about the day to come. I was going to bed and I was uh, literally about to get into bed and I was thinking some thoughts uh, about what needed to be done. Um, and, and I came up and I had to stop, get out of bed, go to this desk and, and type out some notes here uh, because I came up with the name of the group, uh, the, this little club that's on this billboard. Um, and that is corkboard yarn and pins, um, <laughs> and and I will tell you in a minute how I came to that. Um, and I believe I am going to use the name Doctor Sleuth with someone. I have to go back through the comments. Someone suggested this uh, in the comments as as the name of the group. I don't think it makes sense as the name of the group group group, but I do think it makes sense as the name of the site. It seems like the sort of thing that somebody would build uh, to try and gather in a, a community of web sleuths. So, um, but the name of the group, um, and, and, and I thought, well, how are we going to get this? And I just jotted down, the first time we'll actually hear the name of the group is when Zena calls Madeline um, and she says, I knew George from Corkboard Yarn and Pins. Um, and Madeline will say, what? <laughs> Thinking uh, maybe it's a knitting group or something. Um, and, and then Zena will explain it. Um, this is a separate note. I will get to it. Uh, right. Okay. So here, now you're saying to yourself, how did he and why the hell does he think corkboard yarn and pins is a good name for a group of amateur web sleuths? Um, and I'll tell you, I was thinking about uh, George in his garage doing this, this monologue, which I know right now, the draft, it's this rough jumble of stuff. And I was thinking about how eventually I have to show you how the, I turn this rough jumble of stuff into a precise and well-built scene. And I was imagining this scene, and I was thinking about the fact that, I, as I described it, just I was just using cliched imagery from other uh, movies and shows, and I thought... 
you know, George is not likely to be looking at paper copies of photographs. The truth is he would have gathered all of this stuff online. He would have copied and pasted pictures and, and downloaded stuff from other websites mostly. He's that's that's how he's gonna even research into newspapers and stuff would be done online and he would keep PDFs and things, which means he's looking at this stuff on a screen. And when I thought of that, I thought about the fact that uh, what I had originally envisioned was uh, intercutting him speaking with the papers arrayed all around him. You can't see my hands. I was doing this, <laughs> but down here. Um, and and I, that's, a, that's an image. You, when you're writing, you, you get images and then you try to describe them. That's kind of what writing is uh, a lot of the time. Anyway, so what I thought was um, he wouldn't have these paper copies of all this. And so then I thought um, about how there's this cliche about people looking through old files and old folders. Um, and I thought about the name, about the cliche of, of every, you know, uh, obsessive uh, conspiracy hunter with the, the, the pictures on a cork board. And then they, they take pins and they stretch yarn. And the reason that they use yarn is because it's easier to see in a movie. That's a that's a production design thing. I you know I, <laughs> the, a lot of these things that we think are are real things. Genuinely, I, I I suspect that not a lot of people have been doing their detective work with yarn and pins. Um, I, they probably have cork boards, sure. But but I thought about this cliche of of every conspiracy fanatic and crazy person and detective. Uh, early detective, uh, you know, group when you have like the cops uh, on a task force hunting a serial killer, they'll have boards with all the victims and pictures up, and it's it's great, it's visual. And so I thought cork board. I just thought this cork board, but as a like, cork board, you know, it sort of sounds like it could be like software, like you know, hey, you know, we're using cork board to have this meeting. So I thought about cork board, yarn, and pins. This just that these are the things that you're gonna. Uh, see in in any cliched conspiracy unwinder web sleuth uh, detective kind of thing. So I thought corkboard yarns and pins, and and here's the thing, uh, it it just made sense. I knew, I just thought, oh, I like that. It's just uh, it wasn't easy. It wasn't. Uh, detective-y, it was kind of self-conscious. Like these people in this group know that they're doing this cliche of of the of the conspiracy hunter. Um, and I liked that. I liked the idea that you had to, to there was a certain amount of self-conscious humor to it. Um, because remember, this is not supposed to be an utterly grim affair, this this story. Um, and also it just it just was I thought I like it. That 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 strikes me as the first thing I felt that didn't feel like I was borrowing something or taking the cliched version or taking the uh, the safe route. I felt like this is something that is taking a cliche but then showing its consciousness of the cliche, and that struck me as something that I like. And this is really important. This is how you write. I, I really want to make a big point about this. When you are writing, you have literally a thousand choices per page. You have word choices. You have the names of things. You have how people say them. And, and there is no right way. The way that you choose how to write which word or how to name which character or how to have which plot twist happen is you have in your head a vast collection of things you have observed. You have watched other movies and read books, but you have also seen things in your life and they have given you a certain sense of things. It's yours. No one's will be exactly like yours. And the main thing is learning how to feel that recognition of your voice, of your choice, um, learning how to be comfortable saying, 
I like that one. And going, moving on, grabbing it, getting it, saying, oh yeah, this is fun for me. That's what writing is. If I could teach you anything, all the other stuff is stuff you learn over that, is stuff to learn how to operate when running on that principle of, I think that's funny. I like that. This is, this is the core of being a writer. It is not following rules. The rules help you when you're doing this thing, like, uh, like all those things about the self-consciousness of the cliche. Yeah, I can analyze that. But, but the truth is, the way I knew it was I thought, I, I just liked it. I just lit up. Um, and and this, this question had been on my mind for a long time, but I hadn't given it a lot of work. And then uh, I clicked on it. I noticed it. I felt it. it. It stumbled into my field of view and I recognized it. I said, that's my kind of thing. I like it. That's what writing is. Every day, every line you do that thing. Um, so, so that is the first thing um, that, that I wanted to, to get to today, because now we're going to go back to, to the work. Um, let me just quickly check in on a couple of comments. Yes, uh, yes, exactly. It is a digital board now, and we are not doing But the whole point is that these people are, are conscious of, of not being, of, of using the cliche. Um, Yes, that is a good question. Um, I think she is very good. Computer. I don't think she's a hacker. I mean, remember, she's uh, she's she's not so much very good with computers. She's very good with social media. Quite a different thing. Uh, she's very good with people, really. I mean, that's actually an interesting point. Zena's strength is not her tech skills. It's her people skills, her manipulating skills, her playing a role with them in order to become their friend, their confidant, whatever will disarm and manipulate them. Um, so the answer is she wouldn't hack into his PC because it's easier to hack into him. You hack into the person who operates the PC, you don't need to hack the PC. Okay, um, so let us get to this, uh, the text. Okay. Um, so here's the deal. Uh, when last we were here, I had written about three pages of this and it's all just whatever. I was just trying to get stuff down. And frankly, I like some of the stuff I've gotten down and it's begotten, begun to get a shape, but I'll tell you, it's nowhere near right. For instance, this first line, uh, no, that's not how it's going to start. Uh, that's later. I've already put that in later as uh, the FBI sir, will, will name him this. Um, but when I was first writing it, I was just like, get it down, get it down, get the facts out there. Um, so uh, now I know that the way this is going to work is that this scene is going to start with a, a rather convincing, spooky introduction by George sitting in the dark. Um, hello, Wolf. Welcome. Um, so I'm going to do a little bit of editing here to to get, uh, for instance, it's not going to be crappy old task lamps yet. Task lamps yet. Um, um, So I am just rethinking this to make it less um, clear. Yes, by the way, uh, what, Zena, what Zena does is called social hacking. Thank you, Fomart. Um, so, uh, okay, so what I'm doing now is, and, and you're going to be seeing a hunk of this, uh, a fair amount of this. This is writing. <laughs> this is the, the other part where you're not just like, grabbing inspirations and, and feeling your voice, there's a lot of just clunking around words, trying to get them. What I'm trying to do is hook people in to the storyteller, George the storyteller. And then what I'm going to do is having hooked them into the storyteller and the story he is telling, I am going to um, 
un, uh, disappoint you step by step after that. Um, but for the moment, um, uh, and this is going to change again too. So what I'm doing now is just cleaning up this initial description to make it uh, more moody and atmospheric and, and clean, less uh, revealing his uh, shabbiness. Um, and this is kind of a, a trick, you know, you intercut you you um, you give sections of description and sec when someone is speaking, um, in order to break up a monologue, you can uh, take little bits of description and put them in between sections of the speech. It's a trick, but it works. Um, in general, try not to have passive verbs. Is um, they're really easy. Uh, it's really easy to write George is speaking, but George speaks is more is stronger. It's more involving. Um, and what I'm doing now, what I was just doing now is um, I was shaping this sentence to get the the more hooky um, parts into it and the um, the more expository things into an expensive microphone. Um, I wanted that, I was just thinking, do, should he have an expensive microphone? Uh, I don't think I want to emphasize expensive into a microphone, into his microphone, his big old microphone. Um, but the main thing is I want to get George speaks quietly, intently, dramatically, right up there at the beginning of the sentence to hook you in the way his voice supposedly does. Um, and then what I'm doing is I'm breaking up his uh, monologue no. Okay, um, so what, what I've been doing is, is um, and by the way, this continued thing, it's set automatically. Uh, I may unset it at some point. I don't really like it um, because uh, George, George continued. Yeah, we know. We know it's George continued. I find that distracting, so I tend to cut that. I turn, turn that off. It's an automatic thing in, in Final Draft, um, and, and I find it irritating. It, it it suggests that we're idiots, that we can't figure out that this George and this George is the same guy. Uh, <laughs> so, so uh, you know, I, but I don't want to waste time going into menus and turning that off right now. Um, okay. Um, um, so what I'm doing here is I'm just trying to clean up some of the language. For instance, um, I need to get the idea that George is not looking at actual old new, uh, yellow news clippings, but clicking through images on his uh, monitor. Monitor. Um, so by the way, guys, um, uh, so uh, yes, actually, it's a, uh, 
that is actually a good point. Um, two roller sk skate is uh, more passive than went roller skating. Uh, nicely done. Thank you, Maria. Um, you know, not necessarily a bad idea. Um, I'm going to put that down there. Possibly George Smokes. Um, the good thing about George Smoking is it would give us smoke in the scene, which is cool. Um, it does suggest that he's... Uh, in somewhat self-destructive or self-medicating, uh, but that isn't out of character for him. That's why I'm okay with it. Um, although this is a, this is the sort of thing that people, the producers will think about and talk to you about it. That I believe will give it an automatic R rating uh, <laughs> because they are really trying to make smoking not glamorous. So they try to discourage smoking on screen. So I believe smoking has joined the things that will um, that will become a warning uh, on ratings, um, including streaming ratings um, and stuff. So I don't know. I'm not going to worry about that now, but it's just one of those things you don't know. It's just like how many uh, you're allowed a certain number of curses on cable TV, um, stuff like that. It's in my mind because I'm an old hack who has done a lot of this stuff. Um, anyway, so um, we've got here a bunch of stuff. The thing I wanted to get to that I have to figure out, I'm going to have to rework this. It's so funny to think about you guys watching every step of writing with considering how I mean, this, this is like hours of work. I will sit here and, and start to sharpen the language, start to mess with the sentences. Um, that's what a lot of writing is just you know, you run, you get down this, this, sorry, I, I'm reaching out and you can't see it. So I'm trying to reach so that you can see it. You get this, um, you get this stuff uh, jumbled up on your screen. You get, you get everything you can out onto the page, but then you have to start to craft it and figure out how much can they take? How are you steering their eyes? Um, okay. Um, you know, I, I don't really know enough of it, and I don't think anyone should worry about it. Um, sometimes I'm just going to talk about stuff because I'm. <laughs> this is a weird experiment, what we're doing here. Uh, people don't usually write with an audience, and I, <laughs> I got to tell you. So you're just, I'm trying as best I can to just open up my head and let everything out, but some of it's weird. Um, hello, Orfe. Um, okay, so the point that I'm getting to here is I, um, I will be continuing to refine this to make it a good hooky read. You don't want to make your first few pages so dense that they make somebody feel like they don't feel like reading it, that they look at it and they go, this is just going to be a lot of work. You kind of want to, you want to hook them in with a couple of, of relatively clean, simple things and, and build it if you can. Uh, you know, there is an argument to be made for a big, dense description at the beginning. Um, I am not going to say don't do it. I am not going to say, you know, this is part of what I was saying before. There are a, a million ways to write something. And, and you have to feel confidence and conviction and fun with what you choose. Some people will like it. Some people won't. Um, it is something to remember, for me at least, that, um, that honestly, the people who are reading scripts, they read too many scripts. They hate reading scripts after a while. Um, so the more that you can, can get them involved in characters and story quickly, um, cleanly, simply, um, the better, uh, in my opinion. So that's why I'm trying to simple. I'm going to keep getting this simpler and simpler because the truth is, this is all cliched. Um, this is all. Um, I'm deliberately making this sort of X Filesy, sort of uh, any number of other cliches, um, because we're going to un undo the cliches as we go along. Um, 
<laughs> okay, Wolf is telling us about things that would avoid this, the cigarette cliche, um, which includes sunflower seeds and a spat, pile of spat out hulls on top of the monitor. Um, yes, uh, that is, uh, yeah, yep, yeah, yep, yeah, I got it. Um, anyway, not a bad idea. Um, oh, also, um, at some point, okay. Uh, oh, look at that, because that continued isn't real. And hits. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm going to read this out loud so you know what I'm doing. Uh, what I want to do is um, then hits ominously for a second. Then hit stop on his recording. Satisfied breath and opens a bottle water. He drinks deeply. Eh, too many deeps. He drinks a big swig. Thinks and then sets it down and starts recording again. Okay, the reason I'm doing this is because what I decided, here's, a, here's what we're doing. We've got this this one hunk of a sequence where um, George is going to tell us a story all alone in the dark, um, and that is that is the core of this scene. It's George telling us about the thing, and he's going to say, um, "Oh, by the way, I'm going to move uh, the symptoms of his death." Um, Uh, here we go. I'm going to move that here. I'm going to move the symptoms. Um, the symptoms of the poison earlier on, because the big question here is having laid out as much exposition as I can jam into this spooky spo storyteller in the dark thing. Um, I need to then reveal that George is far more pathetic than he than than we thought. And then he has to get murdered. Um, and one of the questions is, how does he get, what exactly kills him? Um, and so he's going to walk out. He's going to go to his kitchen. It's going to be a little sad. Um, and what I'm thinking, what I was thinking was, do we watch him make a sandwich then? Well, this is, this is long. You know, like we, we were hooked for a while, but I think we're going to get bored. Um, so what I think is the water that he's drinking or his tea or whatever it is that he's going to be drinking while he works, he's getting poisoned already and we just don't know it yet. Um, so that the, the, as soon as he walks into his home, he starts to die um, because I, I don't want to drag this out. Let's remember, and this is important, this whole sequence has one purpose, to introduce us to the serial killer and to watch George die. That's it. That if you if you have and nothing else happens here, uh, and and this is this is important. Um, whenever you're writing a scene, you have to say to yourself, "What is the one thing I absolutely have to accomplish here? What do I have to do in this opening sequence? We have to introduce the serial killer, and we have to watch George die. That's the point of this whole sequence. Now, George is never coming back. He's just somebody we're going to talk about about how he uh, did these things that Zena knew about, that he was married to Madeline, but he's over. And therefore, we don't want to get too into George. <laughs> it's so tempting to start to really get into George, but George, George is a one-scene character. He's a guy who we're going to hear about, but the truth is he's a victim. He's one of a pile of victims. Um, so we can't spend too much time uh, with that. Um, George goes in, uh, ah, no, don't want to do that. Um, 
exterior George's studio continuous um, this is just a little thing by the way continuous is just something you should get used to you use it a lot continuous means he opens this door he walks out he goes across the thing that's continuous these these scenes are happening continuously and that time notation is continuous um, so uh, instead of saying day again or saying because that would make, make you might think oh it's a different day uh, continuous tells us what we need to know um, also it helps all the departments because they say okay he's in the same car the same costume etc from the last scene um, okay the point is George walks across his shabby backyard toward his rundown house um, I I'm just gonna do that from there interior George's uh, George lets himself in the door to from the yard to the kitchen is uh, swollen a bit and he has a hard time getting it to close as he goes to do something, which I haven't thought of yet, he gets a funny expression on his face. He slows, sticking his tongue out a bit. It feels fuzzy, thick. His throat is closing up. He's getting Dizzy. Remember all the things that we described already. George recognizes what what is happening to him. He was just talking about it. He is the, um, feeling the toxins. Within. Uh, none, by the way, just in case you're wondering, none of this is going to stay. This is just me trying to get stuff out. Uh, get stuff out of your head and into words. Um, Ellen, hi, a new, a new person. Yes, fly on the wall. Welcome. Um, <laughs> uh, one of the rare times I will just let the fly stay on the wall. Hello, all you flies. Um, so what I'm doing here is I'm just going to say he, George, oh no, oh no, <laughs> he staggers a bit for the wall-mounted landline telephone, but his already somewhat paralyzed fingertips cannot grip the sleek princess phone <laughs> and grip not grip it falls to the linoleum floor no 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 Okay, so here's the deal. What I'm just doing is I'm trying to get some, the, the drama, get, get the feeling, start to get the flow of, of, of what, what I'm going to be trying to do, which is get the reader to go, oh, crap, 
He just was talking about this and make it clear enough. Um, and, and there's no reason to not editorialize. I am allowed to say what he is thinking. That I, you are, uh, this is something that people say, you know, don't ever write anything the camera can't see. Well, here's the thing. The camera can see George acting. <laughs> so, so he needs to know what he's acting. So I am allowed to write what he's thinking, and then he will act like he's thinking about that, and the camera will see it. It's legit. Don't let people tell you that you're not allowed to write what people think and feel in a screenplay. You are. I say so. If, you, if you, anyone gives you a hard time, tell them to talk to me. Okay. Um, so, well, we, so what I'm doing here, this is four pages. Um, I don't know if this will end up being four pages. It might, because it is a big, a big opening scene. But what I'm just trying to do is get, get the shape of the, of the sequence, which is talking in the dark, opening up, walking, poisoning. Um, and so... So now I have done that. I have I have begun to give a shape to this because before I didn't really know how I was going to get to the poisoning part. I just knew that I was going to get there. Um, and and at that point, at this point, I want to take a second to get into another note I had um, because it relates to this, which is um, I got a I got a note. Um, from a guy who who gave me a, I'm I'm going to read some of it, but I'm not going to put it all up here. It's it's um, oh <laughs> I just did put it all up there. Sorry. Um, let me see what I can do now. Oh, I know what I can do. Okay, I'm going to read this to you. Um, at least some of it. Um, Bernard is enjoying this. He's liking it, but he has a question. He he he's thinking about um, George's monologue. Um, the script for his podcast, quote, seems to me a scene that does not really shift the, forward, the story forward as much as provide the audience with some exposition. Um, now, first of all, that's true. That's, that's absolutely fair. I am going to argue that that's okay. Not every scene has to move the story forward. A lot of, a lot of writing teachers are really big into this, move the story forward. Well, actually, exposition does move the story forward because you're you're learning something, and and the story is moved forward by you knowing that. Um, the question is, can we make it interesting and dramatically convincing and not lectury? Um, I will argue that this will do that because we are watching a person take an action. He is recording the the uh, podcast, which is one action. He is also speaking to the world. Which is his action? That's what he's. That's what he's doing in the podcast. He's the fact that nobody's listening, which he will talk about, um, is is doesn't mean he's not making that effort, and he's also trying to provoke the killer. Um, so so these are all actions that are being taken in this speech. The fact that it is an expo expository speech doesn't mean it's not an action, and doesn't mean it's not a scene. So, um, but, but Bernard's point was, couldn't this monologue be transformed into a dialogue with another character, as George argues for his account? Um, such a back and forth then might tell us more about George, his goals, and his character. Um, as his account, as presented, has no challenge, no obstacle, um, and so um, he achieves his goal without any struggle. Um, does that not fly in the face of the first rule for drama, that the need for every goal, every want to be opposed by someone or something? And I thought this was really important to discuss because that I don't think that is the first rule of drama. I think it's a rule of drama. It's nice to have things being opposed, but you don't have to. There are other things you can do. The more that you take in of different types of work, the more tricks you learn. Um, one of the tricks is that sometimes you can have someone making a speech um, and, and, and that speech is an action. And so therefore, even though it is relatively unopposed, un, 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 um, there's no conflict, it doesn't mean we will not be involved because we may recognize 
in this case, I believe I can make it so that, uh, especially because we are just meeting, the, the movie is opening with a speech, um, and, and and this speech is telling us about a, a monster. And so I think that there's a natural hook there. Um, we are wondering what's going to happen. It can't go on too long, and it has to be well-crafted, um, and it has to be, as, as Bernard points out, revealing his character, which I'm going to get into, but it doesn't have to be a dialogue and it doesn't have to be a conflict. And in fact, I, I, it took me a while to realize this, but I actually don't want to do that because of the thing I just mentioned. George is about to die. George's purpose in this story is to be a victim. <laughs> and we are spending a little time with him because his uh, backstory is going to relate to a main character, Madeline. But George himself ain't gonna be a character. He is he is an element of Madeline's life. He is an element of Zena's life and of the killer's life. He is all of those things, and what really matters about him is he got killed. So I don't really want to get him all hooked into a scene because that will mislead the audience into thinking he's a character. And in fact, very often when we see things, we will like, like sometimes a story will go on, all of a sudden they'll cut to a new character, a person we've never met before, and they're doing something that has nothing to do with the story. And that, that's in a way, the, the film, the author's way of saying, here's a new thing, get ready, it's going to mean something. But I'm deliberately confusing, withholding, uh, puzzling you. Um, because I'm going to have to kill this person. So when we meet that, like if you were watching a story and all of a sudden it cut to a character you'd never seen before and they go and they buy their dinner and you watch them step by step buying their dinner, you would be working. You would be looking for clues. Who is this person? What do they have to do with this story? And then if they did something like, you know, dropped something and hid the, the mess of the dropped thing, we go, ah, that, that must, this must be important. The point about all this is that very often it's a setup to a reveal. Uh, in this case, the reveal is this guy's a victim. He's going to be dead. Um, and that's really the fun of this. So, so I, I, um, I have seen this happen a million times. I know how to do it. Um, I am confident that it is the right way for me to do it. It's not the only way. Yes, we could do a great scene where George is arguing with someone about how he's handling this. Yeah, it would be a terrific scene. But A, I don't feel like it. I'm following my feelings. I, that seems like a bad thing to say. It seems like, you know, ooh, you know, you can't just say because I said so. But in fact, you can. I'm working on a video about this. Because I said so is not an acceptable mode of behavior, uh, and yet it's crucial to write, being a, an artist. You do stuff because that one seems better to you than the other one. It just does. And, and you have to be careful, depending on the power relationships um, uh, and a lot of other things. If somebody says to you, I don't think you should do this, and you say, well, I think I should because because I said so, that may not be a good idea. But when you are working on the first draft, when you are working alone, before you have gotten anything, you're allowed to choose that way. You're allowed to say, I feel like it. Um, and in fact, I would urge you to take that feeling seriously. Um, if, you, if you can't imagine another way, like I, I get what Bernard's saying. I, I can see that scene. A part of me actually worked on it a bit. I was like, Hmm, should I really have this be a scene? And then I and then I thought, no. And my instinct was, I don't want to legitimize him as a character. He's not a character. He is a a, a guy being set up to fall in in the first five pages of this of this script. Anyway, um, so that's and uh, by the way, uh, Bernard legitimately argues. Um, George's monologue echoes Barbara Streisand's in The Mirror Has Two Faces. Um, and, and, and ouch, <laughs> because while The Mirror Has Two Faces is a script 
uh, by a guy named Richard Lagravenes, who is a magnificent writer who did The Fisher King. But then shortly thereafter, he did The Mirror Has Two Faces. And that, that movie is just really hard to watch. It's not great, um, in my opinion. Uh, there are good things about it. Um, but but yeah, the, Barbara Streisand does this marvelous speech. And it must have looked so juicy on the page um, in which she is interpreting um, interpreting literature because she's a, a teacher. She's a college professor. So she does this class. And it's a it's a great speech actually, and and it functions properly. But there's something about the film, and I believe it is how Streisand directed it. I don't actually think it's the script. Um, I think that that she can be a magnificent director, but in Mirror Has Two Faces, it's just not working for me. Uh, everyone is entitled to their own opinion. That's what makes horse races. Uh, if you care about horse races. It's an old expression. Forgive me. I don't actually like horse races. Okay, so that's it. That's that's the, the point of, of this little um, excursion into the note about the possibility that, um, that there are other ways to do this scene. There are other ways. Um, I'm choosing not to. Um, if somebody if I was writing this and a studio executive bought it and said, we don't like monologues at the beginning of our movie, you have to have a scene, I could write a scene. That's fine. Cool. I, it, could, it could be fun. But I'm not going to do it now because this is my first draft and I get to do what I want. Um, okay. Brief notes and questions. Uh, a. Hossein. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm so glad. Uh, <laughs> is more of a tool than a character. Yes. Uh, the tricky thing, this is... This is this is another, thank you for mentioning this. This is a tricky, tricky deal. Everything in a script is both a cheap trick, a mechanical gimmick, a, a cold and calculated manipulation, and a rich living uh, human experience. And, and the good writer is the one who can make them both happen at the same time. Um, I, by the time I'm done, I want us to love George to feel that what a fool for doing what he did. Um, but at the same time, yeah, he's he's a device. He's a way to get us into the story and to get some exposition. And he's a, he's a part of the plot. So cool. That's part of the game, to be both mechanical and emotional. Both. You can't afford to just do one or the other. Um, and then uh, I'm going to just say thank you. Um, it's a feeling and you have to nurture those feelings for yourself. Yes, exactly. I really believe this is important to teach. Writing is making choices. And the reason you make those choices is to a great extent because your vision, your feelings, your instincts tell you to. If you can't connect to your feelings and your instincts, if you can't learn the confidence of your own talent and joy, whatever it is, it's going to be really hard to be a good artist. And I think with that, I am going to uh, to, to finish up here for the day. Uh, we've had some fun. We've had some laughs. Uh, and, and we've written some words. So what more can you ask from a Thursday afternoon? See you tomorrow.